I, I really uh, uh, officially have my notes here, so... Yes, <laughs> I can see. Welcome to the Post World Podcast recorded at Calmax Studios Bunker somewhere hidden in Berlin. I'm Pablo De Negri, your host, and today's guest is British visual artist and conceptual artist Dave Ball. Dave, thank you very much for being here. It's great to be here. I think we met many years ago when I was making an internship at Art Claims Impulse. Actually, Pierre was here, uh, I think, one of the first episodes of the podcast or many episodes ago. And actually, Pierre recommended you uh, as a guest for the podcast. It seems uh, your work has a lot to talk about uh, to get it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but it's a tradition of this show to start um, uh, before uh, in the beginnings, in the origins of what uh, for you was the first contact of what you later on ended up um, doing. Yeah, so right back to the beginning. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I guess in terms of becoming an artist, I always liked drawing and um, I think my parents really encouraged it. But um, there was definitely a moment I remember sitting in the back of my mother's car. She lived in France, in the south of France uh, at the time. And we were just kind of driving somewhere um, and I was just looking out of the window and, and watching fields of sunflowers going past. Hmm. And I was just thinking of Van Gogh and I was really into Van Gogh at the time. And I, and I was just thinking, I want to change the world like Van Gogh did. <laughs> you were already into Van Gogh. How old were you? Uh, oh, at this, maybe 17. Because okay. I, I was thinking of becoming an architect. That was the, right. the original story. But then just thought that becoming an architect would might end up being... Uh, quite a mundane job that I would end up designing bus shelters or, right. or something. And art just seemed more kind of romantic. And, okay. And uh, what happened with these sunflowers? I, well, I was really into Van Gogh and um, my portfolio when I applied to art school was full of paintings. Was inspiring Van Gogh? It was full of <laughs> kind of post-impressionist uh, yeah. paintings. And I remember the tutor who looked at it, looked, just looked a bit confused, like, why are you showing me this? <laughs> um, and so, yeah, as soon as I went to art school, I kind of dropped that and discovered more sort of conceptual ways of working, I guess. Well, you went there directly to art school, or did I did. You, yeah, yeah, I was. Yeah, eight, I was eighteen, almost nineteen. So I went. Yeah, straight to art school. Mm -hmm. And why? Why would? Why did she uh, think it was weird to present a, a post-impressionistic? I think it was. Um, it was because the, the the art school I went to was, or I like to think it was quite a sort of radical art school. I now can see in hindsight it wasn't, but. Um, but they were really um, more alternative, or... alternative, and really felt that they were kind of on the cutting edge of um, of art production. And I remember in my interview, there was um, um, so so I, I grew up in Wales, which is not yeah. a, a particularly culturally rich environment, and yeah. um, went um, to the interview, and on the on the way, I went into like a station railway station news agent and bought. Um, a, pa a magazine called Modern Painters. Yeah. And I thought, oh, wow, that sounds interesting. And I just yeah. read this article about um, the painter Gary Hume, who's, uh, who's quite, quite well known. Yeah. And then in the interview, um, the guy um, interviewing me asked me, um, who, who do you think, Dave, who do you think is the greatest living painter? Yeah. And I was just like, um, I, I quite like Gary Hume's work. And I could just see he was like, oh, Wow, <laughs> you're like quite impressed. Hmm. So like I had no idea about contemporary art and they were obviously uh, very <laughs> pushing more contemporary ways of working than Van Gogh. So right. I discovered that. <laughs> it's still modern. It's still modern art. Or yeah, I mean, I, I think now I would be... Techni bit, technically. Yeah, I mean, I think now... I would, I mean, if I was in his position, the interviewer, I would, I would, I would love it if an 18 year old was so enthusiastic about, right. about a modern artist, but it's yeah. just not postmodern. <laughs> yeah. I think this was, this was in the end of the nineties. So perhaps they were still kind of hanging on to the postmodern a bit right. too much. <laughs> and uh, so your first influence, your first impression was uh, painting. You, did you have in your family any 
uh, artistic <laughs> no, uh, references? No, or? no, um, no, no. My family's really not artistic. I have a grandfather who uh, was a he painted commercial posters, um, but yeah, my parents are more kind of in the science. Uh, mm -hmm. Worked in um, healthcare, and uh, so yeah, n I don't come from a cultural background at all. I, okay. I had to really learn everything from 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 zero. Almost. Right. And what did you what did you learn? About, <laughs> uh, course, course. I, um, uh, I, I mean, just just really basic stuff like um, like other other cultural forms like film. I didn't really know very much about anything and just sort of discovered uh like people like tarkovsky who I, mm -hmm. I i think kids who go to art school from sort of cultural backgrounds just know all this Will stuff <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. and um and i just had to like uh, this was before like the internet uh, was, yeah. was really well developed so i had to go and find books to, to kind of teach myself and i was constantly reading books about like the history of film the history of music mm -hmm. i really just trying to catch up a bit with with some of the other kids who, who had, great. had a cultural kind of knowledge but i think this approach when you have to go full on you know um you know you don't know you know y yeah so yeah. it uh, can also be a very interesting deep diving uh, process and um because you see everything more or less with the fresh same eyes. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And uh, what uh, struck you that you found so uh, that you didn't thought it was part of art history or? I think I think I was very sensitive to um, like when people tell you that someone is good, like mm. oh he or she's a great writer or a great painter, and then you go and read a book, and then you feel then you kind of like judging it for yourself. And thinking, well, actually, I don't like this. I don't really value this. Um, right. So it's quite freeing in a way to not come with this kind of cultural ba baggage. Um, but it's also yeah. like there's something about teaching myself, which, which is something I still, um, in my work, I'm still interested in this kind mm -hmm. of idea of the autodidact. Um, right. And, and even, even back then, I was quite into this novel by um, Sartre, The, the uh, Nausea. Who mm -hmm. has this uh, character who reads all the books in the mm -hmm. library in alphabetical order mm -hmm. to try to te make himself a kind of bourgeois educated man and it just mm -hmm. i mean it's a, he's a, like a figure of 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 of, of um he's like a, seen as a bit of an idiot in, mm -hmm. in the novel um but i just love that idea that you can just teach yourself and you make mistakes but there's something really fascinating about that process Maybe it was this related to your uh, dictionary work? In yeah, the yeah. Well, that's yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the dictionary. Do you want me to explain what the? We uh, can talk about. We can talk about that later. I'm just thinking out loud. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> I'm like, ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, that's definitely a reference. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, what did you study? Visual arts or visual arts? Yeah, it was um, fine art. Was fine the art. name of the course? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so it was. Um, quite an interesting course because it didn't divide up the disciplines like painting, sculpture, um, new media. It was just fine art. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I really came from an education that treats art as something quite conceptual, where mm -hmm. if you become a painter, that's uh, that's good. You can realize your work as a painter, but mm -hmm. but they didn't encourage us to start by saying, "I'm a painter." Right. as like a, a kind of label so um even today i slightly struggle when people say what kind of work do you make mm. i never really know what to say except that i'm uh, as you described me at the beginning a conceptual artist that's the problem right when you learn too much about the meaning of things or the relationship between the names and the meaning of things and you learn too much about it you don't know how to name anything anymore am i wrong <laughs> yeah right exactly yeah 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 what, what do i do yeah it's a difficult surprisingly difficult question because you also uh, you started a master in art theory yes. so you went yeah. even deeper in this uh, journey yeah yeah i mean it was partly um partly because i quite liked reading i guess this is again is this autodidact thing mm -hmm. like i really felt when i was studying 
um, that when we were given the task of an essay to write, there was stuff I could learn. Like I could, could go into the library and, and read lots of articles or books and, and get yeah. the knowledge and then write the article, uh, write the essay. Mm. Whereas like if for the actual art practice itself, you can't really do that. You can't, there isn't anything concrete that you can learn to, to make a better artwork. Um, How come? This, uh, yeah, that, that, that's <laughs> well. I mean, like, you'd, I think art doesn't come from a place of knowledge. Um, if it if it did, then logically older artists would be more creative or have better work. Right. But often it's the younger artists who've got like the great ideas and 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 the the, the real kind of raw creativity. Um, and the more you know about uh, art, it helps to be able to talk about it for sure. Mm -hmm. But I, I, somehow that doesn't really make the art better. Mm -hmm. um, whereas I think with with writing, to some extent at least, I think it, I think it it's the other way around. You kind of need to know what you're writing about before you can write about it. Maybe maybe not in creative writing, but certainly in like kind of art theory, right? Writing. Yeah. So during this whole process, you you never started to get a clearer picture of which type of artist you wanted to be, which would have been the objective of studying an arts career. Yeah, I think it, yeah, I didn't, I didn't, I was so naive. I didn't really even understand what, what it meant to be an artist. Mm. Um, I remember going to the first um, private view and, and just, and almost like someone had to tell me, okay, there's lots of glasses of wine there and it's free. Like it's just the basics of like how to even function in the art world. This is very so, important. It is very important. <laughs> you can go in, it's all good. Can go to the gallery, drink the wine. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I have to say, even till today, there's um, a lack of education, cultural education, in people um, to kind of uh, access and transit uh, this uh, world. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, galleries. Um, they are still like this um, sacred white cube, you know, that mm. is a bit... Uh, I, I don't know, I was studying arts and it still was difficult for me because I didn't have experience mm. in um, going to galleries and exhibitions. I was also was studying at night, mm -hmm. so for all my time I was studying, I could uh, almost not go to any... Uh, it was always everything happened at, at 7 p.m. or 8 p.m. I was already in school, you know. So um, that's it's really uh, and it's an important thing actually to learn how to navigate mm. this uh, as a con art con culture con yeah, consumer. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. yeah and I, th I think um, in the last 20 years since I've, I've studied, I think um, art schools are, are much better at teaching this. Like in the UK, they call it the professional practice it's like the, the the kind of basic skills you need to know like which galleries you should approach which ones you shouldn't approach um and like how to make contacts and yeah. like get a website together I, i get the feeling that the the new generation of of art students are just much more kind of they they know what they're doing much more you think so like scene wise Uh, art scene I, I find they've got like a kind of professionalism about what they do. They know how to develop networks. They know how mm. to um, produce exhibitions. And I feel like when I finished art school, I, I still had no idea. And I moved to London. Maybe uh, you had a, a lesser idea. <laughs> well, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, I just I had a kind of a few basic ideas of what you should do. But then I moved to London and London's like an incredibly competitive city that, and, and realized quite quickly that the art world depends completely on, on contacts and networks and right. Yeah. And, and just felt like there was no chance of, of making it. It felt too big. Yeah. Guessing. And no one knew who I was. I didn't, didn't have any, um, important friends or contacts. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because so far tough. until uh, art theory <coughs> master, You were in Wales, yeah? Or um, no, I actually studied my my bachelor degree in a, a town called Derby, which is in okay. in the UK in England. Okay. Uh, yeah, I come from Wales, but I studied okay. in England. And uh, then you, after your master, you moved to London. Or? Yeah, 
Uh, well, after the bachelor. Um, after I the did, bachelor. Yeah. I moved to London when I was 21, mm -hmm. um, expecting to be picked up by a gallery and yeah. become famous within the first two years. And it didn't happen. Then you started for the first time to learn about how the art scene really works. Yeah, and actually the first two years in London, I was really like thinking back, really disciplined at like going to see exhibitions. So just um, like three or four a week for, for two years. I just, I just kind of, ate, and that was more of an education than, than art school in a way. Because then sure. I discovered what was happening in London in the early 2000s. I totally agree. As I said, I uh, uh, extended my careers too much because I was really interested in finding out, you know, like the core of the knowledge of how, yeah. what was that about. Uh, but in the end, um, now I regret all the time I didn't have for actually going to exhibitions. To go into openings, mm. you know, yeah, um, yeah. to kind of start getting into it, because um, uh, in the end, a huge part of it, uh, you don't even have to have a degree, mm. you know, if you can learn to uh, get into the scene and make something out of it. Yeah, exactly. Um, I don't know what's your perspective about it, but at least retrospectively, yeah. it seems like... Uh, yeah, you kind of wish you'd done things differently. <laughs> But, I, I, you know, I think the one thing I learned was um, maybe because I had to, because nobody was 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 asking me to be in exhibitions. I, I realized yeah. that a lot of what what it's about making a kind of career for yourself is is just initiating things yourself. And so hmm. I was part of um, a conceptual art collective at the time. Um, yeah, Disco. Disco, yes. Yeah. So Disco, um, we started five of us. Uh, when we were students at Derby mm -hmm. uh, University, um, which was basically, we were, this was the time when the YBAs, the young Brit British artists were mm -hmm. really kind of dominating in Britain. And, and there's one artist, I don't know if you know her work, Tracy Emin, who's, um, she was, now, now I completely um, can understand why people, um, uh, were into her work, but she, yeah. she was, it was very autobiographical, very personal. Um, and she, um, she, one of her famous pieces was a tent, yeah. like a camping tent that where she sewed the name of every, everyone she'd ever slept with. Uh -huh. So like really autobiographical. She talked, talked about an abortion she had. Um, and we, that conceptual art. Well, kind of conceptual art, but for for us as as conceptual art students, yeah. we were thinking it's just like um, self indulgence. She's had a hard time, and okay, you feel sympathetic for her, but there was no kind of intellectual critical content. It seemed, and we were discovering artists in the sixties, seventies, conceptual artists mm -hmm. who were exactly that, who were kind of like sociologists who, who right. like had systematic works and. Yeah. And we were thinking something's gone wrong in in the art scene in Britain. So, <laughs> so we came up with um, we wrote a manifesto. Of course, um, you had a mission, <laughs> yeah, and signed it and and recorded ourselves having uh, meetings. And I love it. <laughs> um, uh, conceptual uh, uh, collective uh, art group. And uh, there, you told me there was originally an older one called, was called Discotech, or the, it's, so it's the other way around. So Disco uh, was the art uh, student version. Okay. And then after art school, we all moved to different cities. Um, I moved to London, and as I was saying, I was kind of lost in London. Didn't really have any contacts, uh, so <laughs> I kind of thought, how how can I meet some artists? So I just put some posters in a gallery saying. Um, if you if you are a conceptual artist, yeah, um, get in touch. I want to start some kind of dialogue with other um, conceptual artists. And in the end, um, I managed to get a group together, and we became Discotech, nice. which was like the London <laughs> the London branch of Disco. <laughs> I love it. And um, you you were you producing exhibitions or because. Yeah. Uh, it, it would just be enough if the activities of the group would be going to exhibitions and just criticize yeah, everything. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. right. Yes, just. I mean, this would be perfect. Well, I mean, we were a bit too serious to to do that. But the original disco group, we used to walk around the studios that we yeah. were studying in, just like basically doing that. 
pissing off <laughs> all of the other Taking students. Taking notes of everything that's <laughs> yeah. wrong. Oh, just, oh, I don't like that. Um, so, yeah, we were not very popular. Um, but, I love it. This but, yeah, d- Discotheque was a little bit more um, practical and we, we put on a, a few exhibitions yeah. and developed a few quite interesting uh, kind of projects mm-hmm. um, site-specific work. Um, so, yeah, that was a really good experience. We didn't didn't get any kind of high-profile exhibitions, but um, but I, I was starting to realize that that kind of doesn't matter. The, I mean, high-profile high and conceptual art, it doesn't go hand-in-hand, hand, or, or...? Well, yeah, yeah. It's well, The kind of stuff we were doing was not was not the flavor of the moment in, right. in London at the time. So, or, or I don't know. I mean, a lot of your success is to do with how kind of charming you can be at, uh, in networking situations and uh, maybe none of us had quite the charisma or something so mm-hmm. we, we didn't we didn't crack <laughs> london definitely <laughs> i mean it was a conceptual art group i guess it was very um highly nerd uh people yeah I like mean, maybe the, social skills were not the, the well best. yeah <laughs> in the end there was there was two of us who were kind of mostly running the group mm-hmm. and um yeah, I think between us, we we managed not to have any social skills. So. <laughs> <laughs> and how do you come back from that? How do you reintegrate in society and culture after? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I'm not. I know what I'm talking about. I also have my early ages of so radical, artistic, yeah. conceptual groups. You know, I know it takes a rehabilitation the, after that. Yeah, to, yeah, yeah. Uh, broaden your parameters, your spectrum to accept certain things, to be part of mm. more normal, let's say, uh, circles of uh, how, did, yeah. how did you uh, live that? I guess, well, I, I went back to, to school. I, I, I did a master's at that time. So yeah. I kind of stopped temporarily making any artwork. And, and got into kind of theorizing and f- still it was a master in art theory. <laughs> yeah, so it, wasn't, was not getting... it wasn't. It wasn't very far away. <laughs> you were yeah. getting deeper into the uh, the coal. Exactly. I mean, the, yeah, the the way you're talking about it, yeah, it sounds like I knew that I was socially inadequate. But I think at the time, <laughs> I didn't have any idea. So uh, I, and uh, making the master change your view. I well, studying art theory. I thought would would increase my understanding of art, um, but then I quite quickly realised that um, art theory is uh, it's just another kind of art. It's like a kind of game, um, and it it doesn't really. In, and I still kind of think this about art theory to some extent. It doesn't really tell you very much about art. It, it creates a lot of interesting kind of philosophical ideas mm. um, and. Um, and so, so I, I still, I still read it um, a little to some extent, but, but I don't think it's like if you want to find out about contemporary art, art theory is not the place to go. It's, um, it doesn't do that. It just, it tells you some ideas about Deleuze and Guattari and Judith Butler, and it's, yeah. and uh, which is great, but that's yeah. not like. But useful. even even the less uh, um, in the books with Guattari, he was uh, at the end of his uh, some. Acad- um, philosophical con- concept creator career he was reflecting about this uh, retrospectively and uh, was saying that for him uh, concept creation and art are two very dif- yeah, different yeah, things yeah. because when you make when you want to capture a concept of an artwork mm. as an uh, event uh, or something that happened um, happened in the past mm. uh, you will always be too late to capture something mm-hmm. that has to do mm-hmm. with what's really valuable and the sense of the artwork itself yeah. you know and yeah. you will be um yeah uh, writing a fiction or something mm-hmm. that is already mm-hmm. too far away to really grasp uh, some from yeah uh, yeah yeah i think yeah exactly i think you put put that really well and i think when i was studying i kind of quite quickly moved from studying art theory properly to, to more to just studying philosophy mm-hmm. and so i did get into reading a lot of deleuze and alain badieu was was yeah. very very fashionable at that point yeah, and yeah. rancière and they, these kind mm-hmm. of but like reading them as philosophers right so it ended up being more of a masters in philosophy than than art theory so i 
to some extent lost a bit of touch with art at that point. Um, hmm. Wasn't that uh, helpful in a way to kind of uh, be inspired by philosophy in a more freely way? I think uh, so, yeah. Yeah, because I, I, I think I'd always had an interest in, in philosophy. And I think my whole approach to art is about asking philosoph philosophical questions. And I just see art as a way to, to kind of ask questions about the world. So it, it made complete sense to, to spend some time mm -hmm. uh, kind of going, bypassing the art in a way and just going straight for the question. Mm -hmm. um, but then in the middle of that master's, somebody asked me to curate an exhibition about humor, mm. um, which was a bit of a turning point. Um, and he, he asked me because he'd seen my artwork before and, and he'd noticed that it was often funny. And you, you didn't. Uh, well, uh, not, <laughs> I'd never really, I guess I must have been somehow aware of that, but I never really thought that my practice was about making humorous art until this guy asked me to curate a show and then suddenly I was I thought well actually maybe that is that's like a central idea in my artwork which I've never quite even noticed which is weird mm -hmm. and so um and so that that was um that was like a turning point I ended up writing a bit about the philosophy of humor uh, for, oh, for wow. the master's course um But then, yeah, it sort of came back to my art practice then when, when the, when the uh, master's was finished and, and suddenly had this idea that what I was doing was, was playing with humor or absurdity. Or, and so suddenly I had this new, quite exciting uh, approach to what I was doing. So, so I didn't give up making Sounds art. Sounds like a liberation. It was, uh, yeah. It was kind of, yeah, a, a way of... Yeah, this is something. I mean, I love. I always loved humor. I'd always like being. Being. I, I hate TV. I, as, even mm -hmm. as a kid, never watched TV mm -hmm. except for comedy. Mm -hmm. It was like the one thing that that I kind of got the, and and gave me something. Mm -hmm. So so it was quite yeah quite liberating to to think okay yeah this is what I love, mm -hmm. and this is something, which isn't like Van Gogh, isn't like completely out of date. Yeah. It's something that contemporary art can really do and hasn't maybe hasn't done enough, you could argue. Mm -hmm. And so humor was there um, <coughs> because you um, you did a, a PhD research not so long ago, I think, on the topic, and you are teaching now in in uh, Humboldt University also a course on British uh, or humor, the role of humor in British culture. Yes. Also. Yes. But this was way before, right? Um, when you had yeah. this turning point and someone told you humor was a part of your work and then... Yeah, it, it was. It was maybe 10 years or 10 years before the PhD. Um, so, yeah, that, that was quite a long time. So mm. I did, I kind of went back to being an artist and got a, a bit more success at that time, got invited to be on a few residencies mm -hmm. and had some uh, higher profile shows. Um, so suddenly, I th and I think it was partly to do with the name of, of Goldsmiths, where I, I did my master's. Um, if you've recently graduated from Goldsmiths, pe right. people think you're an exciting new right. prospect. And I had to sort of rewrite my CV hmm. to not to, just to say I studied at Goldsmiths. Like, right. I didn't want to mention it was in philosophy. Um, no, <laughs> so, <laughs> they will never take you. <laughs> exactly. So uh, maybe that's partly why. But I, I just got offered a, more opportunities. So suddenly it seemed quite exciting to be an artist mm -hmm. at that stage. And where the first work uh, you um, uh, designed with this new uh, view, so fresh head view, uh, accepting this um, distance or playfulness uh, in your in your work. Yeah, um, I think, yeah, maybe the first, it's not the most important work, but I made um, a kind of intervention work where uh, I bought some tins of food um, and kind of cut out the names of the food, like um, chickpeas, for example, and then rearranged them in an anagram, mm -hmm. stuck them back on the tin. So chickpeas became absent brute, for, <laughs> for example. And and just the, like the, it's, I mean, it's 
it's not the, the the most profound work I've ever yeah. made, but it was kind of funny and it was a nice sort of um, playful intervention. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that that was a work where I thought, okay, yeah, I, I know exactly what I'm doing mm -hmm. with this work. And uh, when did you decide to come to Berlin? Yeah, so that was not so long afterwards. Um, I was invited to do a residency at Art Claims Impulse. Mm -hmm. um, and at, at that stage, I was kind of getting a little bit sick of London. It's a very difficult city to live in. It's so expensive. And, mm -hmm. um, and turned up in Berlin. The sun was shining for six weeks. And, it's um, a trap. When you come to <laughs> Berlin and in summer, you think that it's, uh, it's like this the whole year. And Exa then... Exactly. And yeah, it was, <laughs> uh, we're speaking now in April. And this was April. And it, yeah, the sun. Eight months, a winter, exactly. <laughs> and so, darkness. So I just thought, wow, this is such a wonderful, <laughs> warm city. <laughs> and um, and it was great because the gallery was supporting me. Um, and I mm -hmm. never really had that before, like a feeling that, OK, now I'm becoming professional almost. Right. Uh, and they gave me um, a kind of solo show mm -hmm. at the end of the residency. And I produced um, quite an ambitious work, not the best work I've ever made, but um, uh, it was engaging with the city, doing slightly absurd interventions. Mm -hmm. um, it's called How to Live, the title of that piece. Um, so, yeah, and and then moved back to London after that residency. And and I was kind of just thinking, why did I move? What what am I doing here in London? It's, I hadn't managed to get anywhere with my career in London. So I thought, why not try this other city, mm -hmm. Berlin? So I moved back to Berlin um, in 2009. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then lived the life of a somehow slightly different kind of artist um, when I got here. Yeah, you changed. I'm not sure if I changed, but um, I noticed... Um, as a British person, yeah. that, that Germans particularly have a certain expectation of you, of course, as of being like Monty Python or something. Like, you should be. <laughs> yeah. So, so suddenly you become this sort of character. So you should be very intellectual, but you should also make Monty Python gags. Yeah. <laughs> They, they just the Germans, at least, probably everyone in the world thinks that British people are very polite and very yeah. well behaved. So when they say something funny, it just seems really unexpected or, or something. Did it happen to you that you said something serious and they started to laugh because they thought it was like a British joke? Yeah, <laughs> often, yeah. Or, or yeah, more often the other way around, if I say something ironic and people are just like, <laughs> nodding. Yeah. So irony or um, abs absurdity? Absurdity? Um, is something you embrace coming to Berlin in this uh, work you did? So discovering Berlin and the city and so? I think so. I think more and more of the projects I were doing were um, taking absurd ideas as, as a kind of starting point. So that became, uh, yeah, I started to say instead of humor, I started to speak about absurdity and say mm -hmm. I, my work explores um, absurdity and sense and nonsense and mm -hmm. the kind of work, the way they flip from one to the other. So it became like a real conceptual sort of theme mm -hmm. uh, in my work. And yeah, and in the end, that's why I, I decided to do the PhD in absurdity, because um, yeah, I wanted to go deeper into that topic. Your PhD in uh, absurdity in post-conceptual practice or something like yes, that? Yes, so the title is called The Use of Tactical Absurdity in Post-Conceptual Art. I'm very interested. <laughs> <laughs> so always sounds like a perfect topic <laughs> for this podcast. <laughs> I mean, it's always the way with with PhDs. Like, if if somebody understands every word of your title on a PhD, that's bad. You've got right. to, you've got to have something where people are going, "What? Something new you are researching?" Yeah, right? so there's it's got to be something new. And the new term which I kind of developed was this term, tactical absurdity. Um, because I was quite interested in w what happens when artists um, sort of deliberately introduce absurdity into their work mm -hmm. um, in order to achieve something. So it's almost so that's why the, the word tactic or strategic or right. something. So it's not just being absurd for the sake of being absurd. Um, right, it's tactic, tactical because 
it um, there is an objective, uh, um, an effect you want to generate, and you organize the element in the means in the means to achieve this effect in the observer. Yeah, or th that's 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 how it it started. But I quite quickly realized that it's a bit of a contradiction. And in the end, um, my thesis, for example, celebrates the fact it's a, it's an oxymoron because you can't be tactically absurd because if you if you are tactical, it's not absurd. It's rational. Yeah, exactly. So, so it it sort of doesn't make sense, but it, mm. it doesn't make sense in quite an interesting way. That that's so that became what was driving my PhD research. Well, I mean, the first um, uh, conceptual art like Kossuth, the chair definition of the chair and the photo of the chair. Don't you feel there's already like a tactical absurdity there? I think so, yeah, exactly. I think, yeah, a lot of this early generation conceptual arts, it seems really serious. And I think until quite recently, it's, it's always until been... Until you get it. <laughs> I, I just think people wanted, wanted to read something into it and they just kind of neglected to see that a lot of these artists are really playful and... And in fact, there was one um, great essay by Rosalind Krauss. Uh, she writes about Sol Lewitt mm -hmm. and, and talks about how irrational his whole project is because mm -hmm. he's supposed to be this kind of guy who's very rational. He, um, the idea is the machine that makes the art is mm -hmm. this kind of famous uh, statement. Um, but he also talks about irrationality and he talks about how as an artist, if you have an irrational idea, you have to stick to it and you have to you have to carry it out mm -hmm. as if it was rational. And so right. and so a lot of these early generation conceptual artists, yeah, are exactly tactical absurdists. Um, although... And what did you find in your research about a tactical absurdity in post-conceptualism? What did I find out? Well, um, I found out that not that, well, as I was just saying, not, mm. it's not very well recognized. Mm. Um, it's also very difficult to talk about because um, as soon as you start kind of um, trying to pin down what absurdity is for, hmm. then it stops being absurd. Um, so there's, some, there's something um, maybe a bit like um, beauty or something. It's, it's one of those concepts. That's never escaping. In, well, yeah. you, you, can't, you, can't, you can't ever articulate what it is um, because you kind of destroy it as soon as you try to. Um, and, but yeah, it's. Yeah. I was also making work on my PhD. It was a practice-based PhD, PhD mm -hmm. so I wrote a thesis and um, put a body of work together. Mm -hmm. So it was a very protective time. I was making a lot of work and writing about it, and um, I found it a very, found it a very easy step actually uh, to go from an artist to a, an academic researcher. Because I think that if you're a kind of conceptual artist, you have this kind of rigorous of way, of systematic way. You're more thinking. prepared for being an academic than an artist. I, I, I think so. <laughs> yeah. So it was no, and and I've always loved getting groups of artists together um, and still do it in Berlin and and just sort of critiquing each other's work. Mm -hmm. That's always like a lot of artists who go to art school hate this. They hate having to talk about their work. Right. But for me, that's that's um, that's so so much fun, so important to kind of discuss, well, I've made this thing, now let's talk about Why? it for five hours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and which kind of work were you doing while uh, researching this um, uh, absurdity in post-conceptualism? So, um, yeah, I, so I, I had three what I call case studies, um, to, to make it sound more academic. Um, one yeah. of them was the dictionary project, which at some point we're going to talk right. about, I, I guess. but. Um, we can talk about it for sure. Dictionary A to Z. Yeah. So well, let's let's start with that then. So that's that was a project I started before the PhD, but I sort of managed to bring it into the research. Um, so basically, I'm trying to visualize every word in the dictionary in alphabetical order. Um, so it's a kind of 35-year project. Um, it's just deliberately absurd in in yeah. in, in the scale. Um, and so it started it started out as a drawing project um so i made a drawing for every word beginning with a and yeah. there were about nearly 500 drawings um and 
yeah, that, that was in, in the beginning. I thought it, I was going to draw, make a drawing for every word in the dictionary. But um, it, at, at the end of the A's, I had a big exhibition of those, and um, and it was it was quite a successful exhibition. Somehow, people really understood uh, what what the point of the project mm -hmm. was. And they also really loved, well, there was a comment or lots of comments. People were saying, I love your drawings. You're so good at drawing. <laughs> and I, because I was a conceptual artist, I hadn't really you done didn't any, care about it. <laughs> I hadn't done it when I started that project. I remember I literally didn't have a pencil. Hmm. I was kind of like looking around on my um, desk and I had like an old like HB pencil. Because hmm. I was so not in the practice of drawing, even though drawing as, we, as I said right at the beginning, was, yeah. was the reason I got into art. Right. So I, I kind of rediscovered drawing. Yeah. And other people saw that I had some sort of cap like aptitude for it. But I've always hated that. And it's the worst thing anyone could say to me is, you're really good at drawing. Because the conceptual <laughs> artist, or yeah. the philosopher in me... You just want to die in this just yeah, exactly. I'm just, like, don't, like, don't. All my life was <laughs> for nothing. <laughs> exactly. Because I, I want to ask the questions like, what do you mean by that? What's yeah. good drawing? What's good about right. what I've just done? Why should, why, and why then is they that? walk away. It's like they didn't want this kind yeah, of exactly, conversation. Exactly. <laughs> so, basically. They so, just want to chip chat and... <laughs> So, um, so at that point, at the end of the A's, I decided to slightly reconceptualize A to Z and, and decided that every letter uh, would be a, an, a, a sort of semi-independent project. So the A's were drawings um, and the B's were drawings done from memory. Mm. So that, that was partly a way to get away from this idea that I'm good at drawing. So I thought if I'm going to draw... Um, a, a baboon was one of the first words, the kind of monkey. Um, and I, I know I, I knew that I'm quite bad at drawing animals, but without looking at a picture or a real baboon, I have no idea what 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 they look like. So I just made this terrible drawing of a baboon. <laughs> but you respect the uh, hierarchy that what you think is what you have exactly, to draw, yeah. even though you don't know how to draw it. And, mm. So so these terms, good, good. Good at drawing, bad at drawing. What's a good drawing? What's a bad drawing? Right. I, I wanted to really, really interrogate that. Um, mm. So the B's, yeah, the, the B's was a direct kind of response to the A's, the drawings, which, in traditional terms at least, mm -hmm. are, are not as good, um, but they're more conceptually interesting. Mm -hmm. And then the C's, um, I decided to photograph. Um, Partly because the C section of the dictionary is quite a big section. There's a lot of words beginning with C. So I, <laughs> I quite naively thought that it would be quite a quick way of doing it because I just imagined it takes a second to f take a photograph. <laughs> But then obviously you have to go and find the thing. So right. in the end, the C's um, just took, it took four years to complete the wow. C's. So like if the word is like camel, Yeah. You have to go and find a camel, and so right. so, so I spent a, I spent four years just going to random places and um, and just producing these images, mm -hmm. um, sometimes quite literal images, sometimes more kind of playful. Um, so yeah, the medium changes with that project, um, and the con there are sometimes conceptual parameters or limitations, and the D's. Um, Uh, were drawings done blindly. Uh, so in other words, I, I closed my eyes, mm -hmm. opened my eyes and, and drew yeah. and opened my eyes when it, they were finished and whatever it looked like, that was finished. So that, that was... Um, But it's still something you can think that starts with the letter D or how this... Yeah, this yeah. Work? so, so, yeah. The, so I, it's, it's the same process, going through the dictionary mm -hmm. in alphabetical order, um, I, I select the words according to a few criteria, so it's not literally every word. Uh, but sounds it, like sounds like a surrealist. Mm, yeah, yeah. Mm. It's to do with. Um, uh, well, I think it was inspired by um, an idea that um, Edward de Bono, who has written a lot about lateral thinking, mm -hmm. um, uh, talks about this technique where if you're in a creative block, you're supposed to open a dictionary pick a and word just find a, yeah. yeah and so w whatever you're working on um you have to try to 
uh, integrate that word and, and it's supposed to like shake you out of your kind of linear thinking mm -hmm. um, and it's quite an effective technique um, um, but I kind of wanted to push it into a really absurd territory and thought instead of just picking <coughs> one word, I would um, just do every word. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, there is a, a, a sort of randomness, like alpha, alphabetical order is quite, uh, quite arbitrary. Uh, right. So there are sometimes fortuitously connections. Um, but it, the, the project's all about putting images next to each other in a sequence. Um, yeah and forcing the viewer in a way when they see them kind of displayed to make connections between uh, drawings or connections that are uh, doomed to be wrong because there's not a right connection to make am i wrong yeah yeah um yeah i wouldn't, I wouldn't use the word wrong but um they're, they're not connections that were that are there hmm. for it um and when they when they um, when when connections are made, they are quite surprising sometimes or quite right. unexpected. Um, just thinking of a, an example. So if, yeah, the, the, there were two images, abortion mm -hmm. and abrasive, the, the, yeah. they're like sequential words in the dictionary. Abortion, I drew a picture of some kind of really right-wing Catholic uh, priests making a speech trying to ban ab um, mm -hmm. abortion. And then the next word is abrasive. So I, I use that thing that you, you do the dishes with because um, it has an abrasive right. edge. And so there's something like quite sort of um, in the word abrasive. And then there, there's the this. relation between. Yeah. And so, yeah. and so I'm not, I'm not forcing this connection, but I think uh, you can see the connection because I think we're all kind of trained to like make mm -hmm. connections. So that's, so it's, it's whenever this project's exhibited, it's really exciting because it's just in whatever gallery configuration it ends up in. It's all there's always something new, mm -hmm. and the viewers can quite quite independently go and map out um, their own kind of narrative through 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 the words yeah. that, that we all speak in English, at least. And so you found something from the theoretical, from the conceptual, that's still so lateral in the way that. Mm, keeps the structure open for freely associations and uh, you found you found a way of keeping it fun in a way yeah exactly and um as as i was saying about this tactical absurdity thing so so the the, the idea of picking a word at random mm. um that is quite tactical um because there is there's a motivation for it so if you're um whatever a computer programmer mm. And you can't think what to do with your design or, or, or your programming, and you pick a word, and the word is is cup or whatever. Then there is a, there is a point to it. There's something you, tangible you can take away from that. Mm -hmm. Whereas with my project, there isn't there isn't in the end any uh, really um, well at least not not easily uh, articulable reason why anybody would spend their whole life. Visualizing every word in the dictionary, it's <laughs> it's it's utterly ridiculous. It's the conceptual artwork. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which is the point. <laughs> and now you are in the letter E, or you are working in the letter E. <clears throat> yeah. So the letter E. So we are the fourth letter. You still yeah, have. Yes. <laughs> so I've done four. Uh, ah, okay. Which yeah. So E. So it doesn't. Yeah. It yeah, doesn't. Done four, yeah. It doesn't sound like I've made much progress, but actually in English the first letters in the dictionary are uh, there are m many more words beginning with um, right so oh, really? it, well because if you think uh, the next few letters will be like j k i which are very um there aren't aren't many words beginning with I never thought about it. the end of the dictionary i've become a complete dictionary <laughs> geek uh, i know <laughs> all the statistics about this but so there less there are lesser words starting with the last words of yeah. the with last letters of the dictionary rather than the first words exactly of the in general yeah so q um uh, u v right x y z these are tiny uh, sections of the dictionary so i'm about i think it's about 20 21% of the way through the dictionary so Still a long way to go, but um, yeah, it's a life approach. Yeah, exactly, you, exactly. <laughs> you have to stick with I it <laughs> until I'm an, an old man. So yeah, I've, I've reached E. So that's the yeah. uh, that's the, the newest letter. And um, what can you tell us about uh, what 
what does it look for you today, artistic, pra arti artistic practice, or how to think about your artistic pra practice between your um, you, uh, your uh, work at the university, teaching British uh, culture and humor, between your uh, works as an artist, preparing this um, um, uh, conceptual art uh, works, hunting for words and uh, letters yeah and, um, what does it look for you right now let's say this whole constellation of uh, things yeah it's i'm still i still don't really know why i'm doing what i'm doing um so yeah it's not like i found the answer to to this <laughs> but um but i think um i mean things happen Uh, in your life, I've got children now. I've got yeah. like a responsibility to earn some money, and, yeah. and so I, um, I think in my twenties, for example, I, I wouldn't ever have accepted a job with a salary because I'd think, oh, I won't have time to be creative until I finish the letter C. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, I think, um, I think I can kind of. I, I've also like given up. This this dream that I think everyone starts out with of being becoming a world famous artist in a linear way at least yeah no? I mean but the I I always thought like um, if if it doesn't work out I don't want to become one of these artists who's like in their 60s who's still like self is kind of deluded and still thinks that they're going to become a famous artist um, so I thought well I might just I might just stop and just quit making art, except I thought it would be nice to keep this dictionary project going. And I have this idea that as an old man, mm. I'll have a shed in my garden. I love I'll it. To, <laughs> I'll be doing the, like, the words beginning with, with yeah, said. Conceptual alchemist <laughs> still looking for the... But, the, but that, I think that, that's something to do with my kind of life philosophy is... Right. I think when I was younger, I was doing it because I wanted recognition Whereas I think as the the older I've got, the more I, I think I just do it because there's something inherently satisfying about it. You integrate it as it's, part of your life. Exactly, or yeah. your life ex um, point of view or... And I've, yeah, I've managed to get work in a university which is sort of connected with this and that's great. And mm. um, uh, I'm, I'm very kind of comfortable with my position at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, I have some... A little bit of distance towards the art world, but I still occasionally go to openings and mm. um, and that's it's yeah it, it's in the end I, it doesn't really matter if no one else likes what I'm doing because mm. I'm still enjoying it and I think that's that's uh, important yeah and and I think yeah may, I'm lying to myself yeah I do care that other people mm -hmm. uh, recognize what I do but I think they'll recognize it more if I'm just authentic about it and they'll. I hope recognize the fact that I'm doing it for me. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing it to become famous. Um, I'm doing it because it's it's like deeply satisfying. It's like going back to that Van Gogh story. There's just something right. that is somehow I have to keep doing it. It's uh, and it, it's it means a lot to me. Mm. And I think as an artist, that's that's where your creativity comes from. Anyway, you, sh you should never make mm. what other people want want you to make. Yeah, especially you should be happy, you know, and mm. it's very happy, very difficult to be happy uh, when you are change, chasing this linear projection yeah, yeah. structure exactly. you had of success or how this story should go or mm. what should be recognized and put in value. As long as you grow up, you know better, you know, yeah. like how uh, and you hold on to the things that really helps help you. Uh, in the best case scenario, my point of view, mm. to the things that help you um, achieve happiness mm. in some sort of magnitude, you know yeah, what I mean, yeah. and integrate them more, mm. maybe more in a more healthier way, and not always chasing a linear yeah, effect yeah. of this um, projection, you know, but just adapting it mm, to a mm. life that could be also a happy life, you mm. know, like now, not when you achieve the. Um, Yeah, and I think it's also for other people. Um, I think I, I like artists who also have this this sense that they're just deeply fulfilled by what they do, and are not like chasing after hmm. um, 
uh, recognition or, or fame. There's something, there's something very human about it. Because when you look at an artwork by someone who, and you can just see the love of what they're doing, then, then that's what you get from the art. It's like, it's kind of a shared human love of doing something. Um, so yeah, so sometimes I think like that. <laughs> sometimes I still think, uh, how can I become famous? And yeah, of course, what, what when should... uh, comes and goes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, becoming a father changed your point of view in this whole thing? Yeah, I guess so. I guess um, it's, yeah. I mean, it, it makes, I think all parents say this, it makes you a bit less self selfish or self-centered because mm -hmm. before you have children, you're the most important person in the world. Yeah. And then suddenly you have these uh, little uh, children who are completely helpless and uh, you literally can't not look after them because uh, they won't survive otherwise. So so that's that's a good wake up call to, to <laughs> realize <laughs> you're not the most important. Um, but yeah, and, and just um, because I'm so interested in humor and mm -hmm. being playful, um, it, it's great being around children because mm -hmm. they are obviously playful, um, but they're not like intellectualizing it. They're just they're just playing. They are still like uh, watching the Van Goghs, uh, sunflowers passing <laughs> right, by yeah. out of the window. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, hopefully not. But <laughs> <laughs> and uh, how do you envision the future? Um, do you think about the future since you are projecting also your uh, uh, children's? Uh, life ahead do you think about <clears throat> how everything uh, will develop you have um, an opinion or feelings about it optimistic or pessimistic um about the future my, my future or, or the future do, do you do, ever do, do, think uh, or speculate about any kind of future like society economy uh, your career yeah um, art uh, institution uh, <laughs> If you have those kind of uh, visions, this is the part of the show where yes. we are interested to hear about. Sure. I mean, my own future, I think, of, of talk, of, I'm, it's me as an old man in a shed. To make, ah, I'm making the do, little seats. So that's, my, that's, that's my future. But <laughs> everyone, the, when the, you make the little seat, you die in the last. Basically, yeah. <laughs> the or, last stroke of the seat. Or the most comic moment uh, I, version would be I'd got one drawing left to do and then I have a heart attack and die. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, uh, the, the future, I mean, I think since I've started teaching in a university, um, I've maybe been thinking about the, the kind of new generation because um, um, often it's people who have just left school, they're 19 years old, they've got to university. And it's really interesting getting a sense like what's important for them um and yeah i was just thinking about um i teach another course um which is about the news and how we make sense of of what happens on the news mm. and how you find out news and so on and we were we were just talking about social media and I, and i was just thinking this generation who've like obviously grown up completely in the digital age mm. they're they're so like not into it as a as a concept it's like they don't even want to talk about it because <laughs> they know how off they like when they were teenagers like facebook was already over so so they're, they're right. kind of like they're really the post social media i mean they use social media obviously but but in a really clever way that i think they don't like to think about it as a phenomenon it's not it's not exciting for them it's it's just like somebody of my generation wanting to think have you heard of of, of pens yeah <laughs> you'd be just like what right like there's nothing inherently interesting it's just yeah. it's, it's a it's a platform and so so yeah that gives me some hope for um for the future of mm. you know the, i mean politically it's been such a disaster in the last 10 years the, mm. the kind of influence of, of uh, social media on mm. people like trump and, and whatever um mm -hmm. And I, yeah, I'm quite optimistic that that may be just a blip in, in the kind of democratic uh, history that maybe there are signs we're going to get back to uh, something a bit more... Um, Pre-internet rationality or... Yeah, I mean, I remember the pre-internet 90s. They were pretty it awful. It was not rational. <laughs> <laughs> they were terrible. So, yeah. so it's not like red looking back and thinking we can go something back. Something new, maybe. Yeah. But yeah, something... Uh, yeah, I mean, it's 
obviously it, it's a it's a it's a kind of time bomb with the climate catastrophe mm -hmm. it's going to be a tough uh, it's going to be tough when i think about my children yeah. like what kind of world are they going to grow into yeah um but i think some things will be um a little bit better for them mm -hmm. than than for um for my generation so mm -hmm. it's kind of mixed 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 review of the future yeah <laughs> would you recommend them to study uh, art theory i yeah <laughs> i guess i what i always wanted to do was study philosophy uh, so i don't know i can't imagine like like when my children turn like 17 and they asked me, Dad, should I study <laughs> contemporary art theory? I, I just, yeah. You would be like, no, don't follow that. I think dark I, I think I would I'd say, well, you, well, just just financially, it's it's been it's been really tough the last yeah. twenty years. Uh, you know, like, yeah, you've got to be a little bit crazy to to go <laughs> like into this, this world. Yeah, exactly. So that's what I'd say. Yeah, Dave, thank you very much for being here. We will live in the. Um, uh, in the video and the description of the video links for your works for exhibitions and our claim symbols and your dictionary project we will uh, follow until you get to the letter seat <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thank you for being here again thank you everyone for listening and watching and we we'll see us next time great it was a pleasure <laughs> high five If you enjoyed this episode, feel free to give us a like and a comment under the video. If you want to see more, click here and don't forget to subscribe to the channel.